والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد يسارح الله بركاته We continue in the lesson, <coughs> the chapter which comes in slaughtering or offering a sacrifice for other than Allah. As we explain in the hadith, وفي رواية محدثا لعن الله من غير من غير منار الأب. We explain in the hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in the chapter which the great Imam al Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab رحمه الله. Like we said يا معش الإخوة. These books is the فرقان or the determining criteria or the distinguishing factor in determining determining factor or the criteria that distinguishes between who's calling to Islam correctly and who isn't. For verily, you do not see those who you'll find and who are being, if for the lack of better words, as our people say, bigged up and what the so-called callers are accusing the Salafis of being jealous even though they don't know the affair of the unseen because jealousy is in the heart. So if you say you're just jealous of someone, for verily we know this is a qalbi. For those who are so-called jealous as you claim as you have no evidence for, rather we do not are jealous of people who are incorrectly calling the people and teaching them improperly. We are not jealous of them, rather we feel sorry for them especially the people who are being misguided at their hands. For those who say, for example, we're jealous of so-and-so, as I have challenged and I have asked on numerous occasions, where is your teaching and where is your nurturing and and your cultivation of the people upon these type of books? As I have asked on numerous occasions, where is your completion of Kitab Tawheed, Surah Thalatha, Al Qaid Al Arba? As you'll find that there's no person who is from the Mujaddideen. There's no people who are considered from those who revived Islam truly, except that you'll find that they started with the likes of these books. And for those who ignore these books, and you'll find that their call is so called just information of ayat and ahadith, then we have already experienced that in the 90s. In the 90s, and especially in the early 90s and in the mid 90s, there was a call or a different calls. And at the head of them at that particular time was Abu Musama and Abu Usama and Muhammad Saeed Adli and other than them. As we know, that they used to use ayat and ahadith in all of their talks. And as a result of it, you still find that their da'wah was what? Unsuccessful. Why? Because the people were not nurtured upon what was correct as far as building the foundation for the Islam. So when the people in the waves of fitan hit, the people had already a foundation where they could cling to. So as they could hold on to it, where the wind would not blow them away, whether it be with the currents of misguidance or the currents of becoming weak in their religion or even apostation. As the winds, when they start to blow, meaning when the winds started to blow as far as in pertaining to kufr or disbelief or apostation or even innovation, then you found that they had drifted away, that the current swept them away. Brothers, be, be, be attention, pay attention. I know the flowers and you. <laughs> For the current swept them away. So you'll find that the da'wah of those who do not nurture their people property, properly and their Islam properly, like we said. You'll go to those communities, and you'll find that they utter statements of disbelief. 
you'll find that they'll say, you realize, yeah, Akhi, our culture, we have to put that in priority, and that comes first before Islam. That comes first. You don't know what the black man has been through. And we say, like, we know what the black man has been through. But however, we're trying to, to deal with the matter that is correct, which will bring not only cultivation, but rectification to the black man and all the other races. For verily, nothing is going to rectify any human being except what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came with. And we're not talking about Fadl Muhammad or Farrakhan in their way. The only thing that's going to rectify any human being, whether he be from Pakistan, whether he be the black man from the ghetto or from the hood, or he's so-called upper class, or the person's Pakistani or Arabi, no one is going to be rectified except the da'wah of how, what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. And what he did, he called to the people of monotheism for 13 years straight. That's the reason why I keep asking these so-called callers who the people or the common folk, the common folk are bigging up. Where is their call to the monotheism of the Prophet Sallallahu Where is it? I'm not jealous of you just because you're able to put up a YouTube channel or put up a channel with your phone, you fix your kufi, and you fix your thobe before you start your little talk. And now you, and you have your, your, your crease and your, 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 your tea on the table and all these other things, and you're setting up your phone, making sure it's set up properly, and you're starting to talk. Those things are not impressive. I'm not impressed. Nobody from the sunnah is impressed either. We're looking at your call. I don't care if a thousand degrees you might accumulate it. I'm looking at your call. If your call is incorrect, I'm not impressed. There's alhamdulillah, it's a lot of our brothers, alhamdulillah, who's in magister, who have, have bachelors now, they have masters now. Alhamdulillah, a lot of the Salafis now are starting to get to that level now. So I'm not jealous of that. I have, a, I have my, my best friend who's not here. His name is Uwais of Tawil in the UK right now. Has his masters. Am I jealous of him? He's one of my close companions, my friend. It's not about a degree or academia or academics. If you are misguiding the people, it's a turnoff. You're misguiding the people. So I don't care if you have a doctorate. If it's at the expense of misguiding the people just because you don't want to ruffle somebody's feathers because they're going to give you a check at the end of the day, I'm not impressed. Well, you have to water down something in order to attain a pay? You have to come with generalizations of statements. Oh, yeah, if you take that statement, fine. But if you take that statement from that scholar, then fine. So you have to keep it right, general, so you don't ruffle the feathers of who's trying to give you that money at the end of the day. So if that's your way, then... Fine, but don't criticize the Salafis now who say now you're just jealous because they're able to overtalk you and they're able to gather amongst followers amongst you. Yeah, at the end of the day, all the expense is at what the Prophet did. Are you doing it or not? Point blank. Leave off the personal issues of so-and-so being jealous and all this. Are you doing what the message of Allah, how he gave da'wah for 13 years in the beginning of the wahi or not? Number one, answer the question. Are you doing it? It's clear as day. You're not, no matter who it is as far as those callers that the people know who I'm speaking about. You're not doing it. You have a completed book. You have the Qa'id al-Arba'a, Sittat al-Usul, Kashf al-Shubahat, Kitab al-Tawheed. Where is it? I'm asking, where? This thing is easy as one, two, three. You compare it to the Da'a of Muhammad to what you're doing, it's incorrect. So the people of Sunnah and Tawheed are not going to acknowledge you. Because we know, we know at the end of the day, that's misleading to the people and you're misguiding them because you're building their Islam upon no foundation. So now when the winds and the currents are fit and hit, they're going to blow away with the winds now. Either the winds of kufr or the winds of shirk or the winds of hypocrisy or the winds of, the, of different types, of all different types of kufr that are out there. From democracy, non-Muslim, politics, and you name it. They're all subjected to it because you didn't build no type of what? Shield to protect them. You didn't make it your primary focus, which came as a result of it. The Islam became weak, and that's why when you go to those, pl those places and you sit around those people, you'll find that they utter statements of kufr. If you sit around them long enough, you'll be like, whoa. Which is a clear indication that the person that's teaching them is what? Is not cultivating them properly. And at the end of the day, that's going to be something tremendous on the day of resurrection, that you had to keep it generalized in order to what? satisfy some people because you didn't want to ruffle the feathers of those who are giving you your money. It's sad. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a turn off and it's sad. Like when is this stuff going to stop? 
And now I'm going to go and steer the da'wah in a different direction, which is the direction of how Muhammad Wasallam did. And I told the brothers and I challenged them years ago, and they still have yet to answer. Where is your da'wah for calling to Tawheed? Rather you'll find that now they're coming with qawaid. They're coming from a principle in which I have, and inshallah, I'm going to refute one day, that they use the story of what happened with Harun. The story of what happened with Harun and Musa, Musa in order to justify why they don't call it Tawheed, or why they don't call it to the foundation of, or why they're not doing or propagating the da'wah exactly how the Prophet ﷺ did it. Because we want to what, take in consideration the mafsada or the dar al mafas or dar al mafas wa qadam al jalb al masalih, so called as they say. To get rid of the evil, and we have to give precedence to taking care of repelling the evil over what? Bringing the good or attaining the good. Yahi, what is the most evil of affairs in which you don't teach the people the haq of Allah, firstly, before the hukuk of the creation? The greatest haq of, of, of any human being can fulfill is the haq of Allah. And you're neglecting that in order to come with some balta, some false principle, in order to actualize so you can justify your what? Your nonsense that you are what? Doing right now. Which is not teaching this affair which we've been establishing for years and, uh, and leaving off what the Prophet ﷺ had commanded. Not only commanded, which was the day of all the Prophets without any exception. For ya ma'ashil ikhwaf, if you see a caller doing this, he has totally neglected what we are teaching right now. If you find that all alhamdulillah, all the clear salafi masajid, what are they, what are they doing? You find that they are what? Maybe making seminars around books of aqidah, books of tawheed, books of the sunnah, books of correct and creed, all of that. Where is that? Now if you go to their da'wah, what are they doing? What are they doing? Hadith disciple. <laughs> Hadith disciple. Uh, the fiqh of wudu. No doubt, fiqh of wudu is important. But if a person is falling in the shirk, does it mean anything? Is it going to benefit him anything? Fiqh of wudu, fiqh of knowing whether or not a person is a, a child of the bed, is a child of the, <laughs> the child of the firash is different from the child of zina and all this other nonsense that you're trying to come with in order to deceive the people. All this now, and I do not mean nonsense as far as it being a religion. I'm talking about the way they're propagating the dawah. The way they're propagating the da'wah. Incorrect. Because you know at the end of the day, you start opening, cracking a book up. If you even mention Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, you know somebody in the message is going to get on you. Which is to let you know that those people you sit in with are people of and likewise. And it's dangerous. This affair, like this affair of what we talked about in the last class, when you thought Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. They said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had dathari Rasulullah bi arba'i kalimat. And it's sad now I'm going to talk about first thing, that refutation against that particular individual who teaches at the Haram, who uses that story what happened with Harun. Inshallah, we'll talk about that later. And we'll also refute that later when we get the time to. And also likewise, there's been now people who are starting to put doubt in the hadith of the, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi breaking up into 73 sects and all of them being held except one. <laughs> they, they start to put doubt on that hadith to the people and leaving it up to them to decide. If you think it's Sahih, then it's Sahih. And if you think it's not Sahih, then it's not Sahih. If you go with those scholars who say it's not authentic, then fine. And if you go with those scholars who say it is authentic, then fine. That is an Ikhwani methodology, 100%. Making the, the religion like it's a supermarket. Just cho choose what you want. Whatever you feel is correct, there's scholars that agree with that opinion. Yeah, if that was the case, <laughs> we would open up the religion so now we could say, why do you pray Fajr to the cats? Just do what you feel. Just pray Fajr four. Let's pray Isha two. Just do what you want. Make it, if you go with those who say you can pray maybe two or maybe extra, add an extra, because there are people of innovations that say you can, then go ahead and do it. If you like those who say that the <laughs> also could be recite it loudly, then fine, you can do that too. Anybody that hears this knows this is absolute nonsense. Why? Because it's clear delil to refute that nonsense. Just like it applies at the same hadith, of the hadith of iftiraq, the hadith of the ummah break it down to 73 sects, same exact thing, same exact methodology. Those people who try to say that the hadith is not authentic as far as some of the wording, the ulama came behind them and clarified that that's absolute nonsense. And there's no problematic in the hadith. 
in which we'll bring all the statements of all the scholars and which they say in regards. And we're not talking about scholars of what they think is scholars. We're talking about the scholars of hadith, the uh, of these particular times, especially. The great Imam bin Baz, what does he say? What did he understand the hadith? And also the great Imam, Sheikh Saleh Fawzan, how he understood the hadith. You'll find that none of these statements are being made. He's all right. He's okay. Just leave him in the corner. Put him in the corner. He's fine. He's fine. Just put him in the corner. The hadith of the iftiraq of, of the 73 sects of Muhammad sallam, and all of them are going to hell except one. So some of the scholars that they find it problematic, this hadith. You'll find it say what's problematic for who? For you? Or you just leaving it general for the people to decide again? Oh, I don't know. Leave it general. Let the people decide. What do you decide? What do you feel? Akhi, that is from the most ultimate of, khid, of, of khiana, of deception, and is the most pathetic way to deceive the people in order to bring a narration without bringing what is the correct position in regards to what Ahlul Sunnah and Salafiyin say in regards to clarifying the meaning of these narrations, which we'll talk about discussing this due time. But anyway, Ya Ma'ash al if you get back to the hadith, what the Prophet said, and we stopped at the part where it says what? La'an Allah man la'ana walidayh. Allah curses the one who curses his parents. As we said in that particular narration, what did we say, Ya Ma'ash al We said, that hadith, which the message of Allah Sallallahu has said, لَعْنَ Allah مَنْ لَعْنَ walidayh. But the first thing that you'll notice that the message of Allah Sallallahu started off with, which is what? That Allah curses the one who slaughters for other than him, or sacrifices for other than him. So the Prophet Sallallahu started off his da'wah with what? The call in which he started. His prohibition went back to Tawheed again. So the first thing in which the message of Allah Sallallahu arranged all these particular sins, at the head of all of them was what everyone? At the head of all of them which was pertaining to monotheism in which the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi had highly condemned of an affair that opposes that, which is what? Sacrifice it for other than him. As we talked about before, we said that this is from major polytheism. It's major polytheism which will nullify us. Once Islam, the message of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam mentioned this particular narration that what? It is the what? The greatest of the most evilest until what? The, the la'na or the curse of Allah descends upon the person. The la'na of Allah descends upon the individual. We talked about this last class. So the la'na meaning that one being expelled or put, it, or put far away from the rahmah of Allah, which is something which is tremendous. We talked about the next thing. So you notice that the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he start with, with everyone? In the first part of the hadith, is talking about the rights of Allah. Number one. That's the pertaining to the right of Allah. The right of Allah is what? To stay away from slaughtering or sacrificing for other than him. Then the Prophet ﷺ came after the what? Of what is pertaining to sin, which is what evil is of sin in regards to what? The creation, which is disrespect to one's parents. And one of, one of the most greatest of uquq, not huquq, uquq, or aq, aq al from the uquq of disrespect is to do it to your parents. And to the Prophet ﷺ, as we know, had made the affair of cursing your parents also from the affairs of what would necessitate the curse of Allah upon an individual. And to the Prophet ﷺ said, لعن الله من لعن والدي. And to the Sahaba, رضوان الله عليهم اجمعين, had also mentioned and said, who would do this to a person? Because they were all amazed. Who would be a person that would want curse their parents? Who would be the one who would curse their parents directly? Curse at them, or insult them, or mock them, or even saying oof to them. To the end of what is considered from uquq al-walidayn. From disrespecting or dishonoring one's parents. What is it? The Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had mentioned and said, and explained in another narration that we said last class. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had mentioned and said, when the Sahaba were surprised, who would do such an affair? Who would do such a thing? Who would do such a sin? Who would curse their parents directly? They were very amazed and stunned and astonished that a person would do this. And to the point, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi gave an explanation. We said, 
ويسب الرجل أم رجل فيسب أم We said that a man would criticize or insult or curse the father of another man. And as a result or repercussion, as a repercussion to that, then that individual will curse your father. So the Prophet ﷺ had made that affair as if you were the one that did it directly, even though it was what? Indirectly. Focus. Focus. So we said that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned and said, a man would curse or insult the man of another one. And as a repercussion, that man will curse your father. Which is what? Which the Messenger of Allah had made it as says, if you did it directly. So the fact that you curse another man's father or you cursed another man's mother and as a repercussion to that, they curse your father or curse your mother, you take on the sin of that. So the Prophet had made that clear as it comes in the narration, clarifying what is the meaning of what? This one in your book. So it's not the fact that merely that a person would curse their mother and father directly. As a lot of people would think. Who would do that to the Sahaba? He was even what? He was even astonished and surprised. So for this reason, the Prophet of 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 It was said to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, how could a person curse their own mother and father directly? And it was explained that a man would curse the father of what? Another man. And like we said, as a repercussion, or reciprocal to what he did, what? He cursed your father. So you find that the ulama come with a qa'idah or the principle in this regard where they say, فَأَخْذَ الْفُقَهَا الْفَائِدَ مِنْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ وَمِنْ هَذَا الْرِوَايَةِ أَنَّ السَّبَبْ فِي اللَّعْنَةِ Or as they say, he says, السَّبَبْ بِمَنْزِلَةِ الْمُبَاشَرَةِ فِي الْإِثْمِ that if you caused it or you played a role in it, then you're at the level of the person who did it directly as far as in pertaining to the level of sin or the magnitude of the sin. So it's not, you don't, one person has to do it directly. The person, like we said, indirectly likewise plays and falls into the same level as the one who did it directly. If this is for a person who did it indirectly, what about a person who does it directly? What about, if this is the sin of the person to the point where the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned and said, of course, Allah curses the one who curses his parents. To the point where, like we said, it was said to the message of Allah, how can one curse his mother or curse his parent? What about the person who does it to them directly to their face? Insulting them, mocking them, raising their voice at them, hollering, screaming at them, condemning them, dishonoring them. Any type of affair that will render them unhappy or entering some type of hem or hazard, some type of, of, uh, of sadness and grief within them, that you cause what will be as a result of it. As this affair is tremendous to Allah, to bring ta'ala what? It's the line of Allah will descend upon an individual. So if Allah, to bring ta'ala, is cursing an individual, then how does, a, how does one think he will be successful? How does he think he will prosper in this world as well as in the hereafter? So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this hadith that Allah curses the one who what? Sacrifices for other than him. So Allah, to bring ta'ala, his haq or his right was started within this hadith. Was not to sought one for slaughter or sacrifice to set for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. As you'll find, this code's exact coincides and is directly correlated to what, everyone? Directly to the ayah. As Allah ta'ala says in his book. Now, what Allah ta'ala says in his book, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا that Allah has to proclaim that you do not set up partners with him in his worship and that you want that you be honorable and you be respectful and dutiful to your parents. You'll find that it's kind of here in, in an indirect other way. Rather, it's in the form of the prohibition or what is the opposite. So here, the prohibition of what? Polytheism, which is for Allah. And in the second part of the hadith, which is the rights of who? Of the creation and which is the greatest of creation that deserves honor and respect was your mother and father, which came after the right of Allah, which is monotheism. So, from that disrespect and that dishonor is to curse at them and insult them. In any affair, whether it be qawliyan or fi'liyan, whether it be in statements or whether it be in actions, both. That's comprehensive for both affairs. There's a lot of ayats, there's a lot of them. But this is Surah Al Isra, it's in there.
For the next narration, we stopped, stopped and said, Allah man awa muhdithan. Man awa muhdithan. Allah man awa muhdithan. That Allah curses the one who gives shelter to a muhdith. And this is where we stopped at yet last class, Ya Ma'ish al We said that Allah curses the one who gives shelter to a muhdith. And like we said, there's another narration that says that Allah curses the one who gives shelter to a muhdath. A muhdath. So Allah curses the one who shelters a muhdith. Right, what is the meaning of sheltering a muhdith? As we know, Ya Ma'ish al-Ikhwah, that it breaks down or ihdath. Or ihdath. Ihdath. Or the meaning of ih. Ih. With a ha. Ihdath. Ihdath. <laughs> Ihdath meaning to bring about an affair. Bring about an affair. Bring about an affair either, number one, in the religion, or bringing about an affair in the, in the shu'un al ummah, or the affairs of, of the society, meaning of the people, or the Muslims, of course. What does that mean? Meaning that the hadith is comprehensive for the prohibition of innovating in the religion and giving shelter to the one who comes with an innovative new practice in the religion of Al-Islam. So giving shelter to him and shelter to his, the newly invented matter he's coming with to the point where you'll find that Ahl al-Ilm even mentioned, we'll talk about what Shaykh Uthameen mentioned says, and also the great Imam Shaykh Salih Fawzan, Ibn Abdullah Fawzan, Hamidullah wa ra'ah. You'll find in the explanation of the commentary where he also gives another benefit of saying even if you defend him, defense of him, and aiding him, which we'll talk about insha'Allah, will also necessitate the curse of Allah to bring with ta'ala. By even mere sukut, by even mere silence, without saying anything, is also likewise considered a defense. A mere sukut, or what they call silence, without mentioning their errors and what they're upon, and clarifying it also will necessitate the same thing as, as sheltering them, as we'll talk about, inshallah. So, number one is ihdath fi deen. To bring about an affair in the religion, which means what everyone? Coming with an innovative practice or something newly invented in the religion also necessitates the la'na of Allah to bring with the Allah, the curse of Allah to bring with the Allah. That's why you'll find the Ahl Sunnah that they stay away from bid'ah and its people. Because you'll find of the books and the narrations of the Salaf highly emphasizing how dangerous it is. Because you'll find that they used to say, I am afraid that the la'na of Allah will descend upon you in those type of gatherings. That's how dangerous it is. For the la'na of Allah, tabarika wa ta'ala, like we said, descends upon those who give shelter to bid'ah of newly invented practices or newly invented matters. And it doesn't matter whether it's what, whether a person has brought the affair, that's even, more, that's even more severe. But the hadith is talking about the one who shelters it. How about more, ya ma'ashul al-ikhwa, the one who actually brung it and innovated it? <laughs> Keep in mind the meaning of the hadith, look at it. It says the one who gives shelter to it. If that's the case for the person who gives shelter, meaning, what's the meaning of shelter? Meaning, either defending, protecting, protecting, Defending, supporting, giving aid, all is the meaning of the hadith. And even silence, not making any type of what? Any type of reprimandment whatsoever. Any type of inkar, not any type of forbiddance or reprimandment or condemning of that particular matter or vilifying it and showing your displeased and your displeasure of it. For verily, it would necessitate the la'na of Allah, not only in the affair of what? Not only in the affair of the religion, meaning, ihdath fi deen, 
as far as newly invented matters in the religion, but also ihdath fi shu'un al ummah. We talked about the second category, which is coming or bringing about an affair in huh, the affairs of the society, the Muslim society, of course. And even here to a certain extent, of course. What does that mean? The second category? He's good. You can keep looking. He's good. <laughs> you might talk looking at him, might bring him to make noise again. <laughs> طيب. The second category is pertaining to those who commit crimes. That's the second category. A muhdith, meaning al ihdath fi shu'un al ummah. Meaning a person that's committed a crime. A crime. Committed a crime. And as a result of it, you give shelter them, to them. What do you mean give shelter to them? Same thing. Protect them. Defend them, allowing the channels of the authorities not to step in, whereas not only you defend them or protect them, but you now set out an order to make sure that the hudud or the, the, the penalty for the one who falls into it has not been established. Where, whereas you come in order to what? And to see. And to see for him so the punishment is not established upon him. Meaning from the authorities, not from the common folk. Meaning from the authorities. I mean, if he was in a Muslim land and someone committed a crime, of course, he committed a crime. He stole or he killed someone unjustfully or he did something that was considered corruption within the society, of course. And you have now given him shelter or aid or protection. And you, what is even worse than that is when you ta try to intercede. Whereas the penalty of Allah will be what? Removed from him. As we know, that's also what? Impermissible. Before it reaches the authorities, it's permissible to what? Excuse one another. But once it's reached the ruler, it is not permissible to intercede. It is considered from sheltering him. And the la'na will fall upon you. Whereas we know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the hadith what happened in the hadith of Al-Makhzumiyyah, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became highly upset, extremely. He says, Min, from one of the Sahaba when they had, said, لا يجراء على ذلك إلا أسامة حب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى غضب عليه فلما بلغ الأمر إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فوجد أسامة حاول أن يشفع في حد من حدود الله اشتد غضبه حتى قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أتشفع في حد من حدود الله ثم صعد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المنبر فقال فحمد الله وأثنى عليه فقال أما بعد فإن الشفاعة أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الشفاعة في حد في حدود الله فقال إنما أهلك الذين من قبلكم كان إذا سرق فيهم الشريف كان إذا سرق فيهم الضعيف إذا سرق فيهم الشريف تركوه وإذا سرق فيهم الضعيف أقاموا عليه الحد ويم الله لو أن فاطمة بنت محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سرقت لقطعت يدها As the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم after he had became extremely upset with Usama حب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he says, are you making an intercession for a penalty from the penalties of Allah until he had what? He had came upon the minbar and he started to praise Allah. And he says, Amma ba'd. He said, oh people, verily those are the, from the ways that destroyed those societies and those people from before, that if a person who was rich was amongst them and he fell into that type of crime, meaning of, of, of stealing from something or someone, he said they would leave him alone. Something prominent in the community, something who of high level. He says, Taraku, meaning a person that was honorable, a person that is known for nobility and honor amongst the society, they would leave him alone. And if the person was considered in the eyes of the people nobody, 
a low life, or what have you, they would establish the penalty upon him. He says, I swear by Allah, if Fatih, who was the daughter of Muhammad Sallallahu stole, meaning that he would establish the penalty upon her, could I hand off. However, ya al ikhwa, this affair is before it reaches the what? The authorities. If it, before it reaches the authorities, it's permissible for the people to what? Forgive him or forgive her. In which the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi had highly emphasized. Where he, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, an authentic hadith which we'll talk about. Inshallah bi as he says, he says, al shafa'a fi hadamin min, fi hadamin duni Allah. I'll say for the first part. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, ta'afaw al hudud fi ma baynakum. Ta'afaw al hudud fi ma baynakum. Fa idha balagat al sultan, falaan Allah shafa'a wal mushafa'a. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, pardon one another in those penalties. Meaning, Meaning, do not let it reach the authorities. If, if a person has been oppressed, then if you want, forgive him. He says, however, if the affair has reached the authorities, when it's reached the authorities, it's obligatory not upon the authorities now to what? To carry it out. Also, what happened with Sufwan uh, ibn, ibn Umayyah? As we know the narration, what happened with Sufwan ibn Umayyah? Where there was a person that stole something of his clothes until he grabbed him and took him to the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said of what happened and took place, well, he stole something from him. It was of high value, of course. He came to the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Oh, message of Allah, he stole from me. He said, Now we have to establish the punishment or the penalty upon him. It's reached the authorities now. So the man, he says, he said, wait, wait, wait. He said, ما أردت هذا. This is not what I wanted. He said, فهل لا سمحت عنه قبل أن تأتيني به? He said, then couldn't you forgive him before you brought him to me? Couldn't you have forgiven and overlooked him before you brought him to me? What is the message of Allah? What's the point he's trying to make here? Huh? What's the point? Exactly, that's the point. The point of the matter is, is what? That's not what I intended. I just was trying to inform you. Said, but however, now the another affair has reached the what? The authorities. Once it's reached the authorities, now it's obligatory. Now, if a person tries to make shafa'a, which reached the authorities, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah curses the one who intercedes and the one who's being interceded for. Once it's reached the authorities. Is it clear what I'm saying, Yabaj al Ikhwah? Is it clear? So now if a person falls into in this particular narration of iwa, of giving shelter, this is all part of it. Number one, defending him, protecting him, and even trying to make shafa'a, trying to intercede for him, so he could be pardoned and excused. After it's what? After huh? he reached the authorities. You write this down? After he reached the authorities. Once it's reached the authorities, then what? Now the affairs become obligatory upon the authorities to carry out the commandment of Allah, which is the hudud or the penalties, or the capital punishment that Allah Ta'ala has prescribed for those certain crimes that people come or what they fall into, which comes as a result of it, that person who's from the authorities will have to now establish it. Because that's something that Allah has obliged upon, upon the, the leaders. So the lands will be what? The lands will be maintained as far as their safety and their security. Allah has given them their duties, and He's given the common folk their duties, in which the Messenger of Allah gave clear instructions. Pardon one another amongst yourselves. But if you're serious and now where you want the punishment to be established, for know for sure, once it's reached the authorities, then what? Now it's obligatory to carry out that particular penalty. Is it clear, everyone? So that's what Prophet Sallallahu said in the narration, هَلَّا سَمَحْتَ عَنْهُ قَبْلَ تَتِيَنِي بِهِ couldn't you just part it before you brought him to me? Now it's reached the, the affair or the level in which now it's coming upon the message of Allah he sent him to what? Establish the penalty. As we know, he was the what? He was the ruler. He was the leader the co of the whole society. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So the hadith is comprehensive for what, everyone? Hadith is comprehensive for al ihdath bringing about an affair for deen in the religion and also bringing about the affair of what? In the shu'un al-ummah. 
pertaining to the affairs of the, of the, of the nations of the people or the society of the ummah. When a person cr commits a crime, then, like we talked about before, if this is the case, like we said, for a person who gets shelter, what about for the person who actually fell into the crime? <laughs> if this is the affair of the person who's given... Exactly, it's worse. This is a person, the hadith is just talking about a person who gives shelter to individuals, right, right or not? Just the mere person that gives mere help, or aid, or shelter. What about the person who actually fell into it itself? What would be their level of what? Of sin. So the affair is what? Tremendous. To the point where the lana will fall upon just the mere person who gives shelter. Then what about the person who actually is the one who did it and fell into it? طيب, for the next narration, as it says, for the next part of the hadith, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ غَيَّرَ مَنَارَ الْأَرْضِ Excuse me for a second. Allah curses the one who changes the sign posts or, the, or those the sign posts of the land. No, it's, not, it's in the book. No, you guys didn't bring your books. You have You have it closed. It's no problem. The chat and the, the sacrifice of other than Allah. The sacrifice of other than Allah. Allah curses the one who changes the signposts of the land. What is the meaning of the hadith? What is the meaning of the hadith? Fine. You'll find that Ahl al say that the meaning of the narration, number one, number one, is changing the signposts of the land, meaning of what will be between you and your neighbor, of certain landmarks or certain signposts that are put in order to, to make it clear Acknowledge what is your property and what is his. What is your property or what is his? For those landmarks or those signposts that are put, that are utilized to divide and clearly show what is the ownership or what you own as far as property and land and what your neighbor owns of property and land. For that, signposts, once it's been established, of course, shaitan will come and, and the individual and try to move it. And you'll find that the great Imam Sheikh Salih Fawzan, Ibn Abdullah Fawzan, says, سَوَاءً كَانَ ذَلِكَ فِي التَّقْدِيمُ أَوَ التَّأْخِيرُ فَكُلُّهُ يَنْدَرِجُ تَحْتَ لَعْنِ اللَّهِ تَبَرَكَ وَالْتَعَلَى He says, it doesn't matter whether a person moves it forward or backward, or any what type of way. If he's moving it with the intent in order to what? to show that the particular land now has belong or belongs to him or he's so-called trying to accumulate more land whereas he might move it forward or backward, it doesn't matter. To show that that land belongs to him where he tries to utilize it even though he knows that that property belongs to his neighbor or the person he's against or a person he's living close by, that that falls under the line of Allah. Whereas a person that he moves it or if the person tries to utilize it in order to attain or accumulate more land, whereas that signpost clearly distinguishes to show what belongs to who, or who it belongs to. But if a person does that, and he is taken some type of land out of oppression and being unjust, what the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned of another authentic hadith, ah, wait, someone stuck his finger right in that fan. I had to be kind of stunning like that. <laughs> Tafadl. That's one of the meanings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Try to amass or try to accumulate more land. Try to steal it. طيب. 
طيب ففي البروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم سال من اقتطع شبه الاب ظلما توقه الله تبارك وتعالى من 70 رضيا. He says من اقتطع من اقتطع شبر الأرض ظلما من اقتطع المرء شبه الأرض ظلما توقه الله من سبع أرضين. This is says in the narrative. He says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned said also likewise a hadith was a Sahih Muslim which says whoever tries to steal just a piece of land شبر الأرض ظلما شبر which is like an orange span of land taking it out of oppression. Allah will hang around his neck on the day of resurrection seven earths. Allah will hang around his neck on the day of resurrection seven earths. Seven aradin. You put around his neck. Tawak. Which means put around the neck of the person seven earths. Or seven lands. Or seven earths as they say. Yes. For verily ya ma'ash al-ikhwah that is to show that the lampposts of the person, especially in these days and times, which are done usually, those who are involved in agriculture and live in those lands, in those farmlands, in those remote places where, where they involve more in agriculture or they involve more in pertaining to farmland, usually this takes place. And it still takes place to this day. If a person will try to move or utilize some type of signpost or some type of sign in order to amass or accumulate more land for himself. But this is the case, then we know that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned clearly, he says, مَنْ اِقْتَطَعَ الشِّبْرَ مِنَ الْأَضْلِ ظُلْمًا تَوَّقَهُ مِنْ سَبْعٍ رَضِينَ Whoever tries to cut just a what? Hand span. Of, uh, or, or accumulate a hand span of land out of oppression unjustfully. Then Allah will put around his neck seven, seven earths. For that is to show what? The first meaning of the meaning of hadith. Then you have the second meaning. The second meaning of the hadith is those signposts that were made around the haram, meaning which pertained to Mecca or al Medina. That's the second meaning of the hadith you'll find that the Imma from the Sheikh Salih Fuzawi even mentions. That the second meaning of the hadith is those hudud or, or those signposts that shows clearly which are made to distinguish what is the haram or what is the sacred land and what is not. But for a person that now enters aside the sacred land or the holy land of, of course we know, Mecca and Medina, then it's not permissible for them to what? We know certain affairs is not permissible, such as it's not permissible to hunt or participate in hunting game or to, not even to even what? To scare them away, to alienate them. Nor pluck it or remove its trees and its plants as we know nor is something to be removed removed of the belongings of a person if it's lost. I mean, you might see something of some money, of course. Of course, by all means. If you know if you see the person their money file their pocket, tell them, listen, hey, hey. We talked about something that was left of the property, you see it. It's not permissible to what? To either gather to try to own it. So all those affairs are what? impermissible in the haram and also killing also killing the poly, killing or any type of mayhem or mass hysteria or murder or bloodshed it's not permissible especially in the in, the, in those holy lands of, of haram al Meccan medina the only time we know is is permissible to fight and is when to do it out of defense, out of defense, or in order to allow, or in to, order to remove the polytheists who maybe might have come in the land. For verily here, we know that the authorities will step in and have them removed because it's not permissible to commit idol, uh, idolatry or polytheism in that particular land, which might dis result, of course, a, a fight might break out, or whatever, in order to purify the land of polytheism. So in that particular instance, or those particular exceptions, it's the only time it's permissible to what, basically what? Some type of fight or battle to break, break out, if that was the case. Meaning out of defense or to have the mushrikeen or the polytheists removed. Is it clear? But the origin of the asl is 
that the per one cannot what? Participate in the hunting game, nor, nor even scare the animals. Or pluck away or tear away the different types of trees or plants, of course, removing them or plucking them. That's the asl of origin. There's exceptions, but that ahkam is in fiqh. But that's the origin that we're talking about. Or, like we said, nor killing or murder or what? Bloodshed or any type of chaos or corruption being done in the land. But if a person now transgress and falls into that, then likewise this is a part of this hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ has said what? Those who change the signposts of the what? Of the land. Meaning, that land which is around, or that signpost or that landmark that is made in order to show and distinguish clearly that this is the haram. Meaning that this is the what? That this is or where the actual holy land where it starts at. And this is what bounds it. So you move it, you might even move it forward or backward in order for what? Maybe to what now? Make it more, uh, uh, if you want to say so-called holy or whatever. You play around with those boundaries, or you play around with those signposts, then likewise the same thing falls under the la'n of Allah. Likewise, there's a third meaning to the hadith. The third meaning to the hadith, and people are probably going to be, people are probably going to be uh, surprised by this one. They say the and what is utilized as lands, because even during the times of old, there were certain landmarks that were made in order to what? Allow people to maneuver as far as in their transportation. They were, even if they was on horses or what have you. So there they, they was, there was certain type of landmarks or signposts in order to make the transportation of the people run and flow properly, such as, and what we know these days and times, traffic lights or stop signs. All of those are considered signposts, and all of them consider what? Lamb, not landmarks, but more like signs. In order to make sure that the people are directed so everything can flow properly and copacetically in the society, in the roads, and in the pathways. Right, everyone? Whereas now, if he was to come and play around with it, and do something to it, then likewise, they say that this is part of the meaning of the hadith. Likewise. Both. In light of what the great Imam Sheikh Salih Fouzan mentions in his commentary. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So, what we know as those different signs or those lands that is utilized in order to make, as we know, or utilized in order to help traffic and people go about their way without one harming the other. Also, likewise, falls under this hadith. So the, this next part of the narration is what is utilized, or is, it is, is, is comprehensive for all three meanings. It's comprehensive for all what? Three meanings, ya ma'ashat al-ikhwa. Tayyib. The next hadith is on the authority of Tariq ibn Shihab. Tariq ibn Shihab. And he was a Sahabi, of course. Tariq ibn Shihab al-Ahmasi. Al-Ahmasi. It's in the book, Tariq ibn Shihab. It's in your book. Al-Bajali, Al-Ahmasi. He was a Sahabi. However, Tariq ibn Shihab, Al-Bajali, he was a Sahabi. However, he did not hear from the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So is this narration Sahih or not? <laughs> You'll find, let me, let me just read the hadith first. The authority of Tariq ibn Shihab and the Rasulullah said, دخل الجنة رجل في ذباب ودخل رجل النار في ذباب قال وكيف ذلك يا رسول الله قال مر رجلان على قوم لهم صنم لا يجوزه أحد حتى يقرب له شيئا فقالوا لأحدهما قرب قال ليس عندي شيء أقربه قالوا له قرب ولو ذبابا فقرب ذبابا فخلوا سبيله فدخل النار وقالوا للآخر قرب فقال ما كنت لأقرب لأحد شيئا دون الله فضربوا عنقه فدخل الجنة رواه أحمد طيب a person enter paradise or a man enter paradise in a fly it says in a fly we'll talk about the meaning of it and a person entered the hellfire, or a man entered the hellfire, 
in a fly. We'll talk about the meaning of it. Qalu, how is that, O Messenger of Allah? He said, two men passed by some people. And they had an idol they were worshipping. A sanam. Meaning it was upon an image of a person. He says, it was not permissible for them to pass by until they offered to draw close to that idol by something. Offered to draw close to that idol by offering it something. So one of them, so the people, meaning those people who are the, uh, the custodians of that particular idol, said to one of those two men, put something or sacrifice something to draw close. Draw close to the idol. He says, I don't have anything that I'll draw close. To draw close to the idol by. I don't have anything. He says, draw close to it, offer the sacrifice, to draw close to the idol, even if it's a fly. Even if it's a fly. So he, draw, he offered as a sacrifice to fly. They left him, go, they let him go, and he entered the hellfire. Then they said to the other man, offer something to draw close to the idol. He says, there's nothing that I have to, to draw close, nor is it befitting to draw close to anyone except the law, or anything except the law. So they struck his neck, killed him, and he entered paradise. طيب. So this particular hadith, firstly, number one, Tariq ibn Shihab al-Ahmasi al-Bajali. Did he hear from the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa You'll find that the majority of people of hadith say he did not, even though he's a sahabi. Meaning he saw the message of Allah. He was Muslim and he saw him. But did he hear a narration from him? He might have met the message of Allah, saw him, but did he hear this narration from him? This particular narration? That's the question. You'll find that majority of Ahl-Ilm say that in regards to this narration, that he did not hear this from the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, Tariq ibn Shihab more than likely had heard it from another Sahabi. He heard it from another companion. We will find, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa, that in the chain of hadith, if the one, meaning the Sahabi, is either not known, meaning they don't know the name of the Sahabi, but it's been established that he is a Sahabi, he is a companion, or similar to this narration, maybe one, this particular Sahabi didn't hear this narration. But it was still known that he heard it from another companion. Is this considered authentic or not? This is what you'll find that the, that the of Ahl Ilm, and especially in the science of Hadith, they call this Mursal al Sahabi or Marasil al Sahaba. Marasil. Marasil, something that's Mursal, and of course we know in Hadith meaning that someone in the Isnad was dropped. To the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Someone in the chain of narrators was dropped. For what if it was dropped, we know that that would take the hukum of it being what? Particularly weak. However, you'll find when Ahl Ilm had came to clarify that in regards to the Marasil al Sahaba, that due to the fact that all the companions of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are all trustworthy in their narrations and they're all reliable. Even though we don't know the Sahabi, the Sahabi that narrated, but if it's been established that it was a Sahaba, no matter who it was, then it takes the hukum of the Hadith being what authentic. Even if we do not know who the Sahabi is, but it's been established that it was a Sahabi that related it. Well, it's been established that that Sahabi or that particular companion related it. We don't know. That's called Mursal as Sahabi. Mursal as Sahabi. But Mursal Sahabi and the Isnad does not affect it. Because as long as we know it's the Sahabi, then the, then the narration takes the ruling of it being authentic. Whether it being what? Him being dropped out of Isnad or being frank of who it is. As long as it's been established that definitely who was dropped in the Isnad is a, is a Sahabi, is a companion, takes the ruling of it being authentic. That's what you'll find in the science of Hadith that they call it Marasil, Marasil, a Sahaba. 
That we know that the marasil, or what they call the, or the particular sahabi being dropped out of the chain, does not affect it. Rather, it take the ruling of a what? Of the, uh, of the ruling of the hadith being authentic. And that's what they call Mursa Sahaba. Taib, I don't even read when they call uh, I'm bringing an example of this a little bit later on. Even though that some of Ahl Ilm does give the ruling to say that it's Mokuf. That it's a, what do they mean, Mokuf? Meaning, in actuality, it's a statement of a, a Sahabi. The meaning of Mokuf. Mokuf means it's a statement of a, a, of a Sahabi. You with me? The meaning of Mokuf is that's a statement of a what? Sahabi. You'll find that the, a lot of Ahl Ilm. It says, say that what? This particular narration is mokuf upon Tariq ibn Shihab. But the origin of Marasil al Sahaba is that they're all acceptable. Doesn't matter. However, you'll find that even though it is Marasil al Sahaba, however, you'll find that there's another hidden weakness in the Isnad, which is Imam Ahmed and his Musnad. It's our time to get into it right now. But at any rate, to establish the fact that it's Mursa Sahabi, even though we know that it still does not affect the chain, there's another hidden weakness in this chain. What is from the Mu'an'ana or the Tadlis of Al A'mash, Al A'mash in the Isnad. Who's A'mash's name? Sulaiman ibn Mihran. Rahimahullah. Sulaiman ibn Mihran Al A'mash, he was an Imam, Thiqa, Thabt. Imam. However, he made some type of deception called Tadlis where he said An. He didn't make Tahdith. He didn't say Haddathana. However, he made An Anna. <laughs> any rate, I want to get inside the science of it. Not right now. But any rate, they say that that's the other hidden weakness in the Hadith. Where Sulaiman ibn Mihran al A'mash, that he, he performed what they call An Anna, which is a type of Tadlis. But at any rate, to make a long story short, because I don't want to get into to this right now too much. This particular narration, let's just say it's mokuf. It's a statement of the Sahaba. So still, at the end of the day, even though it's a statement of the Sahabi, who's Tariq ibn Shihab, the hadith still is what? It's still correct. Because it was a statement of the Sahabi, of an affair that was pertaining to the unseen. So that reason, even though it's mokuf, we still will say that the hadith is still what? It will take the hukum of a hadith as if the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said it. Why? Because these are from affairs of the unseen. Especially the affairs that took place of the umam of the past. Which we'll talk about, talk about inshallah. Of what took, took place of the umam of the past is from the affairs of the unseen. Nobody knows that. Except what Allah had revealed to the message of Allah So that particular instance we say, in this particular chain, that even though it's mokuf, it's a statement of a sahabi, who's tariq ibn shihab, but at the same time, what everyone? We say that still, it's from the affairs of the unseen, in which we know none of the Sahaba will ever talk about the affairs of the unseen from their own opinion. Ever. If you'll find that the, any of the Sahaba talking about an affair of the hereafter, or the affair of, of Shu'un al-Ma'ad, or al-Ghaybiyat, or Shu'un, or al-Matalab al-Ilahiyya, meaning pertaining to Allah, or affairs of Allah, or Allah having a particular attribute, or Allah having a particular uh, of action, or affairs that took place from the unseen in the past. All those are affairs which you'll find that none of the Sahaba gave from their own opinion. Because they had the i'tiqad and the belief and it's, that's not permissible at, at whatsoever. It's not permissible to say, for example, about the affairs that Allah had created the seven heavens and the earth and he rose above the arsh, and they gave that understanding except that they had known that that was an affair that was established that they heard directly from the message of Allah. And then they related that what? That understanding. They would never make ijtihad or come with their own opinion in these particular affairs, especially of the ghaybiyat, of the unseen. Especially affairs that takes place in the future or affairs that already took place in the past or affairs that's pertaining to Allah or affairs pertaining to the hereafter or in Jannah or the hellfire or whatever. 
If you see a statement of Sahabi, they made it, the chain is authentic, even though it's mokuf, it still takes the hukum of a hadith and is marfu'ah. It still takes the ruling as if it's a hadith of the Prophet It still takes a hadith. Why ya ma'ish al Because none of the Sahaba will make or perform ishtihad for themselves in, particular to, in these particular matters because these affairs are not permissible for one to give his own opinion in. So they knew there was a text or they knew that they heard it from the message of Allah. Tayyip, at any rate, Tariq ibn Shihab that he said, that he entered in paradise, a man entered the, par- entered the, the hellfire because of a fly. Isn't this from the affairs of the unseen? Isn't this not from the affairs of the unseen? A man entered the hellfire because of a what? Because of a fly. So he entered hell. Is it permissible for one to come now with this type of what? Understanding? Or this own opinion in this regard? Is it permissible? Permissible? That's the reason why these are from the affairs of what? The unseen. For a person to enter the hellfire is from affair of the unseen. A person to enter the paradise is from the affair of what? It's not permissible for anyone to give their own opinion in these matters. Except that it was something of revelation that was revealed. In which the sahaba, this particular sahabi understood. So it says that he entered the hellfire because of a what? A fly. And likewise a man, similar likewise, into the, uh, entered paradise because of a fly. He said that two men, they passed by people who were devoted towards worshiping an idol. Tayyip. If you notice in this narration, it says fee, that they entered the hellfire, fee dubab. A lot of people will understand it, it says in a fly. As we know, the huruf al jar tatanawab. As we know that the, as we know that the huruf al jar, or, or huruf al jar, of what was pertaining to the, uh, how you tra- translate I just, I just had it in my head and it disappeared. Is it a pronoun? No, it's not a pronoun. Oh, I can't remember the translation for harf al But anyway, the word fi in the English language naturally means what? In. However, depending on the context, it can what? It can change. So fi here means because of a fly. The person entered the hellfire because of a what? Fly. And a person entered paradise because of a what? Because of a fly. Five. So one of those men had trans, or went, uh, they passed by a particular idol. And they said, draw close. Or offer something to draw close to our idol by that particular thing. What happened, Yama Ishul Ikhwan? He said that, I don't have anything to draw close to, your, to the idol by. Meaning was just to show closely that he was what? He was pleased with the affair. So the affair not only agreed outwardly, but it agreed inwardly. Both. It agreed with his near and agreed with what he was do- doing what? Outwardly. Both. So what he did not show any discontentment, nor did he show any reprimand, nor did he show any type of what? Any type of displeasure for what? He was going to embark upon what he was going to commit. Meaning that he was what? Fully in contempt with it. Clearly. The only thing that he excused himself, or the reason why he excused himself is just because he didn't have it at that particular time. Not because he what, truly believed it was what? It was haram. It was, incor- it was impermissible. The only thing that he pardoned himself for is because of what? I just don't have it. I don't have anything to offer. But the problem was that he was truly, to sh- he actually showed by a statement that he was what? He was content with it. That the act, there was nothing wrong with the act. Right or wrong, everyone? There was nothing wrong with the act. Displaying and showing his pleasure for it, his contentment for it, he's pleased with it, and he's in, he's in agreement with it. Is it clear or not? Whereas the actual, the opposite of the narration, you'll find in the last part of it, what does it say? What it says that another man had what? He says, it's not for me. Now I will offer or draw close something except that it's only for Allah to be good to others. So he clearly showed and manifest his discontent for what they were asking him and him being pleased and agreement with what was tawheed. And that was it. It was monotheism. Of unifying and singling out Allah to be good to in this particular aspect of worship of which we're discussing now in this chapter which is sacrificing for only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But however, what was asked of him was to sacrifice for other than Allah. 
even if it was something that we declare or what we deem or what we believe as being something merely with no value to it or something small. Doesn't matter. Even if the affair is small, however, the aspect of it being polytheism, it still makes it what? Tremendous. And the magnitude of it. Doesn't matter if even it was something that a person what? Would deem to have no value or something that a person would deem to be what? Lowly and despicable. A little fly? Okay. Sacrifice a little fly in order to tra tra uh, to pass by and mind my business and can let my life flow and okay, I'll do it. However, this person, due to the fact of the ta'zim, or the magnification of monotheism in this person's heart, which came as a result of it, he said, what? I has nothing that I will offer as a sacrifice except that it is only done for Allah to bring with the Allah. Which came as a result, result of it? Now they struck his neck and killed him. So, فَضَرَبُوا عُنُقَهْ فَدَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ ضَرَبُوا عُنُقَهْ فَدَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ That they struck his neck and he entered paradise. For Ya Ma'ish al you'll find this particular narration. What Ahl Ilm have mentioned this regard that they say? Even though it's something that it is low of what a person would deem to be lowly, does not matter. Polytheism is polytheism. No matter what is used or offered in order to draw close to that thing, it's something minute, something small. However, if it's polytheism, it's still considered what? Polytheism. You'll find in this narration likewise, if you go and return back to it, it says that the man had clearly said that I don't have anything to offer or sacrifice, which agrees with the mu'allif or the author has said in this particular chapter of displaying how sacrificing or offering to other than Allah to be with the Allah is from polytheism, which will nullify one's Islam, which if a one was to die upon it, he will enter hell forever, if he dies in that state, which is the most evilest of, 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 of the most evilest condition that one can die. So it says, Ya Ma'ash al that we said, notice it says that two men had passed by our people, that they had a sonam, a sonam, as we know, meaning an idol in the image of a person or an animal. That's a sonam. That's a sonam. The sonam is ma yudu'u, ma yudu'u ala surah. Hayawan kan o insanan. Doesn't matter. So the meaning of sonam is ma yudu'u ala surah hayawanan kan o insanan. He says that which is put in the form of an image, whether it be a what? what does it matter? It doesn't make a difference. Whether it's an animal or a human being. That's called a sonam. That's called a sonam, sonam, or asnam. Wathan is more general, or awthan. Wathan, wow, tha, noon, wathan. Wathan is something that is more general. General whereas it could be put in the form of an image or other than that. It could be a tree, rock, doesn't matter. That's called a wathan. So what is a sanam? It's put in the image of a human being. What is a wathan? It's more general. It could be a form of a human being. It could be a form of an animal. It could be a form of a rock. Tree is more general. Anything. That's a wathan. Here it says that it was a sonam. So it's only specific for a type of idol that was put in the image of either a human being or an animal. So he said they were not letting anyone pass by their particular idol unless they sacrifice something. When the man had now offered that particular fly, which was to that sacrifice, to draw close to that particular idol, as we know, the Prophet, or oh, excuse me, in this particular narration, excuse me, that Tariq ibn Shihab had informed that the person entered the hellfire as a result of it. Don't close your book now. <laughs> close it. <in. laughs> it was time now? Oh. It's time already? Uh, Amir. Amir in the office, I mean. Is it time to call these in? Yeah, we got a couple more minutes. What about two minutes? It was about two minutes, three minutes, right? 
Huh? I'm sorry. How many minutes? Are you looking at the schedule now? Okay. It's in now? I couldn't hear you. What'd you say? Oh. Yeah, you want you want to call in there? Hold on. Married at you. Yeah, he's married at you from the van. He got an attitude. He got a two. That's how my son is. My son, <laughs> he's a trip. Yeah, I'm sure he'll, he'll love him. Love you for now. He hate you for now. Love him for you later. <laughs> I'll hate you for now. Love you for later. Allah for the love for him. Jay, we got about what, 10 minutes into the salah? 10 minutes? What is it? Usually you call the comment like 10 minutes after. Five. Read some of the masail. Read the mis the the uh, the masail. Masail al bab. Masail al bab. Iqraha. Allah yahfidha wa yaf. Allah yaf tika lafia. Iqraha al masail al ula. Read the uh, the first issue that the great Imam, the great that he put is the first masala. I think the hadith, inshallah, is clear. But now there's some other certain affairs that we want to address before. That's going to come along as we read the masala. First, read the first one. Tafadl, uh, Jamal. Jam I may call you Jamal, Mr. Jamal. But Tafadl. Jay, for the first masala, says the tafsir of Qul inna salati wa nusuki. That say my salah and my what? My prayer and my sacrifice. We gave the tafsir of that, right? What is that, right, everyone? Tawheed wa uluhiya. Type number two. <coughs> Likewise, similar to that, the tafsir of for praying. For your Lord and sacrifice for him. We gave the tafsir of that, right, everyone? Meaning? The beginning of the ayah in inna a'taynaka al kawthar. Verily, we've given you the kawthar. So, out of shukr for Allah, pada ni'mah, meaning that's still tawheed, al rububiya. Then, establish the salat, which is a worship, and likewise, sacrifice for, for Allah. Out of thanks, out of giving thanks for what He's given you of the kawthar. And we know that. Verily, we've given you kothar. We ver verily, we have given you the kothar, meaning that kothar or that particular well in paradise, which falls inside the hell. Oh, this is inside the affairs of Aqid. But anyway, that's Tawheed al rububiyyah In order to what? Establish Tawheed al uluhiyah Five. The third thing.
instituting the curse upon the one who sacrificed for other than Allah. Is this, is this correct? For verily, Ma'ash al Ikhwah. To start, of course, number one, what is understood is that a person in his dawah always starts with what? Monotheism. He already starts, he starts his affair in the dawah with monotheism. And likewise, what contradicts it and opposes it, which is what? Polytheism. Because the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa in so many instances, what do you always start with? The haq of Allah. The right of Allah, which is the greatest of huquq, or the rights of Allah, which rather it is the greatest right of Allah, which is what? Monotheism and singling out him and worship to barakah wa ta'ala. Right, everyone? Starting with his haq, before the haq of anyone else. So you find in this particular narration where it start off, it start off with the haq of Allah. In the beginning of the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is what? That Allah curses the one who slaughters or sacrifices for other than him. So this narration, <coughs> starting off with the haq of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, likewise, like we said, it coincides with the ayah where Allah wa ta'ala says in his book, and someone else just already said this, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ لَا تُشِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا he says, worship Allah, do, sit up, do not set up any partners with him, and have excellence with your parents, so, as far as duty, and as far as reverence, respect to the end of it. Taib, wa'abudu Allah wa la tushiku bihi shayu wa bilwari dayni ihsana wa bi dhil qurba wal yatama wal masakina wal jari dhil qurba wal jari dhil qurba wal jari dhil junubi wal sahibi bil jambi wa bini sabi wa ma malaka daymanukum. Inna Allah la yuhibbu kun mukhtaran fakhura. Inna Allah la yuhibbu man kan mukhtaran fakhura. It's that. So Allah Ta'ala says, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَلَا تُشِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا He says, worship Allah, do not set up any partners with Him, which is the first command of Allah. So the first thing that a person calls to in his call, and if you see a caller not doing that, know for sure he's propagating the da'wah incorrectly. I don't care if he has a doctorate, I don't care if he has a master's, I don't care if he has 20 doctorates. If he's doing what is in contrast to what the Prophet ﷺ did, it is incorrect. And it's not for you to now go, at, go behind and say you're jealous. And why am I saying jealous based upon the person had did what was incorrect and opposed to religion as far as giving doubt to the people? How am I jealous? You see the man is clearly doing what is incorrect. The message of Allah started his call with this, along with all the other prophets. So this is the call that will give rectification to the societies and to the ummah in general. And know what color, it doesn't matter what color, ethnicity, ethnicity it is. Rather, the only thing that's going to rectify any human being is the doubt that Muhammad Sallallahu came with, which is the call to monotheism first. No more, no less. So that's what you'll find coincides with the ayah, which comes in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah Ta'ala clearly says, Worship him alone and set up, do not set up any partners with him. Subhanahu Jalla fil Ula. So I was says, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa. Now, as far as the la'na, is it permissible now to curse a person specifically? هل يجوز هل يجوز لعن المعين هل is it permissible to specifically single out worse a person and curse them based upon this hadith the answer is no it's not permissible it is not permissible to make well, as long as a person first of all we'll start with a person living it is not permissible to curse a person specifically If they're living, and even if they're in a state of kufr, <laughs> you understand everyone? In regards to what happened with the message of Allah وسلم, it's not permissible to specific or specify one and curse him. Say, may Allah made a curse of Allah or may Allah curse you. It doesn't matter if he's a, is a Muslim or not Muslim. If he's living, it is not permissible to curse him. In regards to what, as far as if, if he's Muslim, that's even worse. But maybe perhaps Allah Ta'ala will want, inspire him to make tawbah where he will leave off that particular sin. Then, then he'll be, from, of course, from those who are close to Allah. And if he dies in it, then he'll be from the awliya Allah, inshallah, who died upon of tawheed and monotheism. So a person can be inspired to make tawbah. You don't know what his, his outcome will be. Right, everyone? So that's the reason why that's even for the kuffar. It's even for the kuffar. 
upon what you'll find that Ahl al-ilm, what is correct, is not permissible to curse a, sp- a person specifically. May the la'na of Allah be upon you. Is it clear, everyone? In regards to what happened, which, all this is going to come in the next chapter that's coming, because I don't have time to get into it now. Where the Prophet ﷺ had cursed a, cur- a certain people until Allah sent down the ayah in order to admonish him and say, He said, فَلَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهُمْ وَيُعِذِبُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Allah Ta'ala sent down the eye when the Messenger of Allah said, oh, so and so, oh, curse so and so, curse so and so, curse so and so. And Allah sent down the eye, this affair is not for you. Whether or not Allah will accept their tawbah, meaning guide them. Or punish them. For verily right now they are oppressors. But the outcome, finally, as we know, all of them became sahaba. <laughs> In that particular narration. All three of them became from the Sahaba, meaning that they became from the awliya of Allah. So that's the reason why we said ta'ayin or ta'ayin ay wahib min al-nas bil-la'n la yujuz. Now as far as after, meaning them being from those who are dead, and it's been established there are people from the hellfire, meaning Abu Lahab, or those who the Prophet Sallallahu who Allah has mentioned, or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, it's something different. But as far as in regards to a person in, in life, now you cannot say to a person, or even a Muslim, may the la'an of Allah be upon you. It's not permissible. Why? Like we said, due to the fact that you never know if that person might, number one, make tawbah. Secondly, also likewise, even though that person committed an act that might have necessitated the anger of Allah upon the person, they still have some type of hub, love for Allah and His Messenger, even though he committed a specific act that is in contrast to what Allah Ta'ala and the Messenger has commanded. What is an example of that? The example of that is what all goes back to happen with the Khawarij, or the refutation, the ahadith that we use in order to refute the Khawarij. Pay attention to this. Pay attention. For verily you'll find during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu what happened to Abdullah, wa kani yulaqabu himaran, wa kani yumazihu Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kathiran, for one of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu abda. What happened with him? In front of the Sahaba, his name was Abdullah. And his laqab or his nickname was Himar. Donkey. Why? Because he used to make the Messenger of Allah laugh. And he also no, he used to make the Messenger of Allah laugh. Until one day he, he became. He came weak and he fell into drinking intoxicants. فَأُوتِيَ بِهِ إِلَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَجُلِدْ ثُمَّ أُوتِيَ بِهِ إِلَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَرَّةً ثَانِيَةً فَجُلِدْ فَأُوتِيَ بِهِ مَرَّةً ثَالِثَةً حَتَّى قَالَ وَاحِدٌ مِنَ الصَّحَابَةِ اللَّهُ يَلْعَنُ أَوْ لَعْنَهُ اللَّهُ مَا أَكْثَرَ مَا أَكْثَرَ مَا أَتَى بِهِ إِلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تقول هذا فإني أعلم أنه يحب الله ورسوله he says what happened with the man he fell into drinking khamar or drinking intoxicants one time and he was what the penalty was established upon him until one of us says that from us who hit him was struck him with our shoes and from us who struck him struck him with other things in another narration then he fell into it again and he was brought to the message of Allah until he was what? Until he was lashed or until he was established upon him the penalty. Then again, until one of the Sahaba said, Allah, may Allah curse him. Allahu yala'nu. Until the Prophet ﷺ prohibited it. He said, Do not say that. Verily, I know that he loves Allah and his messenger. So even though he fell into something of what? Of something that was incorrect. Still they're not now. Necessitate, number one. He's still in the fold of Islam. That's number one. He's still Muslim. Number two, also likewise, even though his, of what happened, what took place, he still, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi had affirmed that he loved Allah and his Messenger. So it was not permissible to what? Curse him. Even though he committed an act, that is an act of one being cursed. So that act is one thing, and now invoking the curse of Allah upon a person is another. Now it's permissible generally to curse. For example, to say, La'an Allah al-Kafirin. May Allah, the curse of Allah be upon the kuffar. Or La'an Allah al-Munafiqin. 
لعن الله الكافرين لعن الله المنافقين that's permissible is it permissible it, just like it comes in this hadith لعن الله من ذبح لغير الله Allah curses the one who curses or slaughters for other than Allah permissible because it's done what huh? generally not specifically is it, is it clear what I'm saying it's done generally not specifically على سبيل العموم جائز على سبيل التعيين غير جائز is it clear everyone except for after if a person dies if a person dies then what it's something different if it's made clear may Allah and his messenger are made that someone died in the state of kufr it's something different but as long as the person is what is alive he's alive even if he's a kafir even if he's a kafir you don't know what his outcome would be Allah ta'ala can now inspire him to embrace Islam and make tawbah to the end of it and be upon istiqama of rightness which likewise, like we said, similar to what happened during the time of the Prophet of what happened to those three Sahaba who were upon Kufr at that particular time. And the Prophet had invoked upon him to Allah sent down that ayah It's not, this affair is not for you. Meaning that maybe perhaps that Allah will guide them. Which truly was what? Which truly happened and what carried out, that all three of them took, took shahada, all three of them became, not only from the sahaba, from, from the best of sahaba, all three of them. In which, which to show, you'll find that Ahl al-Ilm say it's not permissible to what? To specify a la'na, a curse upon a particular individual, even if he's upon kufr. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? And likewise, we take from the benefit of this, even if a person commits an act that necessitates a curse of Allah, for example, like we just gave a mention, a person drinking khamar, drinking intoxicants, doesn't that necessitate the la'an of Allah? A person drinking khamar, Prophet ﷺ cursed. He said, la'an Allah, sharib al-khamar, wa mukilahu, wa hamilahu, wa al-mahmul ilayhi, ila akhirihi. Huh? No, no. Prophet ﷺ cursed the one who drinks it, the one who transports it, the one who carries it back, the one who sells it, the one who makes to the end of it. Curse them all. طيب. That particular now, particular hadith, when a person commits the act, is it now necessitated, it's permissible for you to say, عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ or لَعْنَكَ اللَّهِ Is it permissible now for you to say, لَعْنَكَ اللَّهِ? Huh? La. However, you can say, لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى شَارِبِ الْخَمْرِ مثلا. May Allah have the curse upon those who drink khamr, generally. But to say, O oh Allah, may Allah curse you for drinking, drinking intoxicants, not permissible. Is it clear? Huh? طيب, we'll stop here. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه سبحانك الله بحمدك وشهد لا إله إلا أنت أستغرك وتب إليك After the class, because right now we got to